Atoms are the fundamental building block of matter. Atoms combine together to make all the different compounds in our universe. Atoms are composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. All three particles play an important role in the atom, but it's the electrons that do the work when it comes to making compounds. J.J. Thompson is credited with the discovery of the electron in 1896. Thompson used a cathode ray tube, which was a device that heated a filament until it released a beam of particles. Thompson placed a positively charged plate on one side of the particle stream and a negatively charged plate on the other side of the particle stream. The particles were attracted to the positively charged plate, which led Thompson to conclude that the particles were negatively charged. Electrons circle the nucleus at certain energy levels. It was originally thought that the electrons orbited the nucleus in rings, similar to the orbits of a planet in our solar system. Although now we know that this model is a little too specific about the location of the electrons. The electrons do exist at certain energy levels, but the energy levels don't look like rings. This lesson is all about the electron. So what are we going to learn in this lesson? We're going to learn different methods of showing where the electrons are around the nucleus of an atom. First we'll learn about Bohr diagrams, then we'll learn about quantum numbers, and then we'll learn about electron configurations, and then finally we'll learn about orbital diagrams. The Bohr model of the atom uses rings to show where electrons are located around the nucleus and how much energy the electrons have. We have already learned that energy levels don't look like rings, but this model is still very useful because it helps us to understand how many electrons can exist at a certain energy level. Each energy level can hold a certain number of electrons before it's filled up and we have to move on to the next energy level. The first energy level can hold two electrons and each level after that can hold eight. Let's draw the Bohr diagram for chlorine so we can see how this works. To start, we draw a little circle to represent the nucleus. Most people will put the charge of the nucleus, that is the number of protons, inside this circle. We'll write 17 plus because the atomic number of chlorine is 17, which means it has 17 protons. Chlorine has 17 electrons because the number of protons and electrons will be equal in a neutral atom. So now we're going to show the electrons fitting onto each ring. The first ring can hold two electrons and we're going to represent the electrons by little dots. Put two little dots in the first ring. Now we'll move on to the second ring. This can hold eight electrons, and so we'll put eight little dots into this ring. We've accounted for 10 of chlorine's electrons. We still have to account for seven more because chlorine has 17 electrons. So we add a third ring, and we can put the next seven electrons into this ring. That accounts for all 17 electrons. Bohr diagrams again are useful because they show which energy level the electrons fit into. However, they don't describe what these energy levels actually look like. Now the Bohr model really works well for hydrogen, which only has one electron, but it doesn't actually work that well for anything else, which is a pretty big problem because there's 117 other elements that we can't really describe very well with the Bohr diagram. In the 1920s, a new model was developed called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics treated the electrons not as tiny particles moving about the nucleus, but as waves of probability, kind of like waves of light. Werner Heisenberg was one of the developers of quantum mechanical model, and his principle, called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, is the foundation of the quantum mechanical model. The principle states, it is impossible to know both the position and the speed of an electron at a given time. Electrons are moving with incredible speeds, so the principle essentially says that we cannot know exactly where the electrons are. We can only know the region of probability of where they will be. This is what quantum mechanics is all about. It's a model that tells us where the electrons are expected to be located around the nucleus. It's all about probability. Quantum mechanics essentially gives the address of an electron. The electron's address is described by three quantum numbers. These quantum numbers work very much like our own address. Our address has some basic components, like the city, the street, and the house number that we live in. Each of these parts gets a little more specific. The city gives a general region of probability, but if you were trying to find me, the city wouldn't provide enough information. If you know what street I live on, you have a much greater probability of finding me. And if you know the house I live in, you have a really great probability of finding me. But that's as far as the quantum numbers go. You can narrow down to a pretty small region of space, like a house, but imagine standing outside of my house and looking at it. You couldn't know exactly what room I'm in, or even if I'm in the house for sure. I could be at work or at the grocery store, but the probability is very high that I'm in there. Here are the quantum numbers. The principal quantum number, symbol n, is like the city. It is also known as the principal energy level. This is kind of like the rings on Bohr's diagram. The angular quantum number, symbol l, 
is kind of like the street. It is also known as the sub-energy level, or just sub-level. And the magnetic quantum number, symbol m sub l, is kind of like the host. It is also known as the orbital. So orbitals are the name for an electron's host. Electron hosts are regions of probability, like a cloud of where you would expect to find the electrons. And they have really funny shapes. We'll get to some of these shapes here in a minute. Now the numbers have very specific values. Remember Bohr's diagram said that the electrons will exist at certain energy levels, but they will not exist between those levels, and this is still applies to the quantum numbers. n will have positive integer values starting at 1, and then 2, and 3, and so on and so on. Each of the following quantum numbers will be based on the previous number. l will have positive integer values based on n. It starts at 0 and goes up to n minus 1, so usually L will have multiple different values. Remember that n is like the city, so say you are in a city that has an n value of 4. This is a city with the principal energy level of 4. The streets, that's the quantum number L, will be 0, 1, 2, and 3, because 4 minus 1 is 3, and so that's where we'd stop. So this particular city has 4 streets. Street 0, Street 1, Street 2, and Street 3. The angular quantum number are commonly given a letter. This relates to the shape of the orbitals on that street. 0 is given the letter S, 1 is P, 2 is D, and 3 is F. An S street, or S orbital, is when L is equal to 0, and it will have orbitals, houses, that are spherical in shape. And a P street, that is L equals 1, will have orbitals, or in other words, houses, that are peanut shaped. And then a D street, L equals 2, will have orbitals that are double peanut shaped. And an F street, L equals 3, will have orbitals that are flower shaped. M sub L is based on L, so each street will have a certain number of houses. That's what M sub L will describe. M sub L is all whole number integer values from negative L to positive L, including 0. L is equal to 2, the values of M sub L will be negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, and positive 2. So that means there will be 5 houses on an L equals 2 street. Each of those digits represents a different orbital, or different house. Now each orbital can hold a maximum of 2 electrons. If there are 5 orbitals, that means there could be 10 electrons total. If L is equal to 0, the M sub L value will be 0, because negative 0 to positive 0 just be 0. There's only one orbital on an S subshell. Okay, so let's summarize. On the first energy level, that is N equals 1, there is one sublevel, L is equal to 0. This is an S sublevel. There is one orbital, M sub L will be equal to 0. And so on the first energy level, there can be a maximum of two electrons because there's only one orbital. On the second energy level, that is n equals two, there are two sublevels. L is equal to zero and L is equal to one. So there is an S and a P sublevel. The S is different from the S in the first energy level. This is a two S compared to a one S. And so the higher the energy level of the S, the larger the orbital will be. They're both spherical shape, but the 2s will be slightly larger than the 1s. So there will be four orbitals altogether on this energy level. m sub l will be 0 for the s sublevel, and m sub l will be negative 1, 0, and positive 1 for the p sublevel. Since there are four orbitals and each can hold a maximum of two electrons, this energy level can hold eight electrons. On the third energy level, that is n equals 3, there are three sublevels. 0, 1, and 2. There is an S, a P, and a D sublevel. Now there will be 9 orbitals, because M sub L will be 0 for the S sublevel, M sub L will be negative 1, 0, and positive 1 for the P, and M sub L will be negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, and positive 2 for the D. Remember that each of these values for M sub L represents an orbital, so that's 9 orbitals. The third energy level can hold 18 electrons. Okay, let's go up one more energy level to the fourth energy level, n equals 4. There's four sublevels, 0, 1, 2, and 3. That's an S, P, D, and F. There will be 16 orbitals. We'll have m sub l equal to 0 for the S, m sub l equal to negative 1, 0, and positive 1 for the P, 
m sub l equal to negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, and positive two for the d. And then finally, m sub l is equal to negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, positive two, positive three for the f. The fourth energy level can hold 32 electrons. The quantum numbers are the address of an electron, but how do we know which energy level, sublevels, and orbitals the electron is going to occupy? There is an order to the way the sublevels are filled. The Aufbau principle states that electrons will fill the lowest energy level first. There's a cool trick to figuring out this order. Write out the sublevels in a grid like this. First energy level has the 1s, second has the 2s and the 2p, third has the 3s, 3p, 3d, and so on. Now draw diagonal lines. If you set up your grid properly, it will look like this. The order that the levels get filled will follow these arrows. Follow the first arrow, and then when you finish an arrow, move to the second arrow. When you finish that arrow, move to the next arrow, and so on. So now that we know the order, we can write electron configurations for elements. Electron configurations are more detailed than a Bohr diagram because they tell us the number of electrons that will occupy the energy level and the sublevels. Here's how it works. Let's write the electron configuration for selenium. You first have to look at the atomic number to determine the number of electrons in that atom. There are 34 electrons. So we need to show where these 34 electrons go. We write the sublevels in order and we use superscripts to indicate the number of electrons in that sublevel. S sublevel has one orbital, it can hold two electrons. A P sublevel has three orbitals, it can hold six electrons. A D sublevel has five orbitals, so it can hold 10 electrons. And an F sublevel has seven orbitals, so it can hold 14 electrons. The 1s can hold two electrons, so we'll write it like this. 1s with a superscript two to indicate there's two electrons in there. Now that is filled, so we'll move on to the next sublevel. We can use our grid to show what comes next. So next is going to be the 2s. It is also an s, and so it can hold two electrons. So we'll put another superscript two here to indicate there's two electrons in there. I've now accounted for four of the 34 electrons. I still have 30 to go. The next sublevel will be the 2p. A p can hold six, so I'll put a six up here. And then we move on to the 3s. This is another s, and s's can hold two electrons. It doesn't matter what number is in front of the s. So now we have accounted for 12 of the 34 electrons. Next will be the 3p. It's another p, so it can hold six electrons. And then we'll have the 4s, which can hold two electrons. And then the 3d. A d can hold 10 electrons. And now we've accounted for 30 electrons of the 34. So there's four more to go. So after 3d is 4p and a p can hold a maximum of six electrons, but we only need to put four in there because the total number of electrons is 34. And so this is the electron configuration for selenium. The final method of showing where electrons are is called the orbital diagram. Orbital diagrams represent the orbitals with a line or a box on an energy scale. Low energy is at the bottom and then increasing energy as you move up. Electrons are represented by half arrows. Remember that each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. We still have to follow the Aufbau principle, but we also have to follow Hund's rule and the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle states that orbitals can hold a maximum of two electrons, and that electrons have to have a different magnetic spin. This is represented by a fourth quantum number, called the magnetic spin quantum number. The spin is either going up or going down, so we'll represent it by an up arrow or a down arrow. The other rule is called Hund's rule. This rule states that electrons will occupy empty orbitals before pairing up. So as a p orbital fills up, the first two electrons will fill the orbitals like this, in different orbitals rather than in the same orbital. So let's draw the orbital diagram for silicon. Silicon has 14 electrons. So first, the 1s is a s sublevel. It has one orbital. So that's why we have one line right here. There will be two electrons, one spinning up and one spinning down. Now we can move to the 2s. This can also hold two electrons. Next, I move to the 2p. A p sublevel has three orbitals, so we have three lines like this. Each orbital will have two electrons, one spinning up and one spinning down. So we've accounted for 10 of the 14 electrons. Next is the 3s, which can hold two electrons. We only have two more electrons to go, and they will go into the 3p. And they will occupy separate orbitals like this because they need to follow Hund's rule. So did you learn everything in this lesson? Well, if you did, you learned electrons surround the nucleus within certain allowed energy levels. The location of the electrons are described by quantum numbers. Bohr diagrams show which energy levels the electrons of the element have occupied. 
Electron configurations show which sublevels the electrons of an element have occupied. Orbital diagrams show the orbitals that electrons have occupied. Electrons fill sublevels and orbitals according to three principles. The Aufbau principle states that electrons will fill the lowest energy level first. The Pauli exclusion principle says that an orbital can hold two electrons maximum. And Hund's rule states that electrons will occupy empty orbitals before pairing up.